There are basically two ways of achieving environmental policy goals. One is laws and regulations. Another is what are collectively known as market-based mechanisms. So carbon tax, you charge carbon emission and people reduce carbon emission. You can legislate that uh, you cannot emit more than certain amount of carbon. Or you can require the use of a specific low carbon uh, technology. In terms of market-based uh, uh, mechanisms, taxes, you tax, say, flying, and people fly less, carbon emission is uh, reduced. Or you can use carbon markets. So people can trade uh, their permits uh, to pollute according to their needs. Most uh, mainstream economists think market-based methods are much more effective, whereas many environmentalists uh, tend to believe that uh, we should achieve this uh, through regulation. So on this issue, environmentalists and neoclassical environmental economists have struggled to understand each other. Robert Goodin, a leading political theorist, called this situation a veritable dialogue of the deaf. So basically, <laughs> they just uh, cannot understand each other because that, uh, they don't speak the same language, they don't hear each other. So let's uh, try to make sense of this debate and uh, discuss uh, what kind of the tools are more effective in what way in dealing with uh, environmental problems. So let's uh, first uh, consider some classic environmental problems, overgrazing of common land, overfishing of the sea, dumping of polluted uh, water into a river, emission of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. These are obviously examples of so-called negative externalities, you know, someone doing something without thinking about the consequences for other people. Now, interestingly, some economists have suggested introducing property rights over environmental assets will solve environmental problem. A surprising insight from this uh, line of inquiry is that actually it doesn't matter who owns the property in question. So when a factory pollutes a river in a situation where, say, fishermen downstream own the river, the factory will have to give money to the fishermen for the right to pollute their river. Yeah? Alternatively, the factory owner could uh, own the river and the fishermen will then have to pay the factory owner not to pollute his river. Obviously, the fishermen will uh, pay the, the factory owner not to pollute the river only if the value that they get from unpolluted water is greater than the money they have to uh, pay to do that. Now, the interesting conclusion is that either way, allocating property rights to someone ensures that the optimal level of pollution occurs. Yeah? This outcome can be described in another way. The right to pollute basically ends up with whoever values it the most. So for example, the factory owner keeps or buys, depending on who owns the river, the right to pollute as far as it is worth more to him than preventing pollution is worth to the fishermen. Yeah? Now this argument that an optimal outcome is reached uh, regardless of how property rights are distributed is commonly known as uh, the cost theorem. This idea was first proposed by the English economists who taught first in LSE and then University of Chicago, Ronald Coase. And this is uh, quite commonly used uh, in economics and indeed law textbooks to discuss environmental problems. His point was actually that the result will hold only if there's no cost involved in allocating the property rights and conducting the necessary negotiations over the compensatory payment. He called this cost transaction cost, which is the central concept in a school of economics that uh, he was one of the founding fathers called the so-called new institutional economics. So actually, Coase's point was that transaction costs matter. Market exchanges are not costless. Establishing and enforcing pro property rights is now costless. And because of this, 
this uh, that, uh, so-called cause theorem is not going to hold in reality. He saw it as a thought experiment that emphasizes the importance of uh, transaction cause. Yeah? So actually, he was very unhappy that <laughs> this theorem was uh, uh, named after him because <laughs> he used it to prove that it doesn't actually happen. Yeah? So according to the cause theorem, after trading in carbon markets, the emission permits will end up being owned by the firms which value them the most, that is, the firms with the dirtiest technologies. Yeah? Basically, these firms will find it most costly to reduce uh, emission, so they would uh, find it easier if uh, they just uh, bought the right to uh, emit carbon in the carbon market. The result is that the uh, emission reduction happens where it is least costly because uh, it will be reduced uh, by the firms that will find it easiest uh, to reduce and then they'll sell the remaining permits uh, to firms that uh, find it most difficult to reduce emission. Yeah? So this is uh, known as the least cost argument. Yeah? Carbon market allows the reduction of uh, carbon emission in the least costly way. And this is uh, one appeal of uh, these carbon markets among policymakers. But of course, uh, the problem is that there are some very unrealistic assumptions that have to hold for carbon markets to work in this way in reality. First of all, there's the assumption of perfect information. Now, for the emission target to be achieved at least cost, permits must end up at the firm where emission reductions are most costly. That's obvious. But this will happen only if all firms have accurate knowledge of their own emission reduction costs and in particular how these costs may vary with emission levels. They do not necessarily know this. Even if the information is available, people have found through empirical research, firms and individuals do not seem to exploit emission reduction opportunities. So there was this famous McKinsey report in 2009 in which it was shown that many emission reduction options like installing LED lighting or insulation retrofits of uh, houses, they actually have negative costs. Yeah? You might spend the money, but over time you're actually going to earn money by uh, investing in these alternative technologies. But relatively few firms and households actually have done this. Yeah? I mean, it's that, uh, a bit of a puzzle. You know, it could be the result of uh, sheer inertia or could be the result of what uh, Herbert Simon, the founder of the behavioralist uh, school, called satisficing. Yeah? Simon pointed out that actually making the decision itself is uh, quite costly because you have to search the alternatives and then uh, weigh the, the, the cost and benefits. So actually he said that people typically stop their search for solution when they find a good enough solution. Yeah? They are not necessarily looking for an optimal solution because that will be very costly in terms of search and decision-making cost. So he says uh, people satisfy rather than optimize. Yeah? So maybe that's uh, what is going on. Maybe uh, people look for some alternatives, they find something good enough, they just don't look at other things. But whatever is <coughs> going on, it's clear that perfect information doesn't exist. And more importantly, even if reasonably good information exists, people don't seem to be exploiting it. And in that kind of world, it's uh, highly unlikely that uh, this uh, the carbon market is going to work according to the theory. Yeah? The second assumption behind the argument for the carbon markets is that of perfect competition. Permits will not be freely traded if one or a few firms dominate the market. So, for example, when the, the EU started this uh, carbon market known as ETS or Emissions Trading System, that was uh, back in 2005, the Czech electricity company called CEZ was allocated a third of the country's emission permits because it was uh, such a dominant yeah, uh, emitter of uh, carbon. Interestingly, uh, CEZ sold these permits that year when the price was high and bought them back later 
after the price collapsed, and then use the profit to invest in coal-based electricity generation. It completely undermined uh, the purpose of the carbon market, but then he could do that because it was such a dominant uh, player in the market. Yeah? Thirdly, behind this argument for the carbon market, there's the assumption of perfect property rights. Yeah? Basically, in order for the carbon market to work, permits need to be clearly defined and fully enforced. In reality, you know, definition of the permit size de debatable. Enforcement is a problem because that uh, you know firms can just emit carbon uh, beyond their permit if there's no government inspection, there's no punishment, and in many countries these uh, the mechanisms are quite inadequate. Yeah? Also, firms uh, that may legitimately fear that the government may change the rules. Yeah? And therefore, they might be reluctant to invest in cleaner technology today because that, uh, you know, the, what if uh, the government uh, suddenly you know, stops you know, enforcing this? Uh, what if uh, the government suddenly stops subsidies they used to give to solar panels? You know, these things happen. So uh, there's uh, a host of problem there. But the most problematic assumption in the argument for carbon markets is the assumption of static technology. Carbon markets, in essence, work by encouraging short-term cost saving through the adoption of best available current technology. So you, you have the, the current technology within that uh, technological regime, you are reducing uh, emission. But in the long run, the best way to reduce emission is likely to involve the development and widespread adoption of new technologies, yeah? so-called green technologies. So if uh, that is uh, the, the best option, maybe carbon markets are just uh, the, the barking up the wrong tree. Yeah? Well, of course, uh, when you say that supporters of carbon markets come up with a response, carbon markets actually give people incentive to cut emission because the more you cut your emission, the more promise you have left, and the more of them you can sell in the market and earn more money. Yeah? Academic economists, including uh, the, uh, many mainstream economists, uh, have uh, started accepting that this is actually quite an incomplete argument that tells only half of the story. Yeah? Because permit sellers, potential permit sellers, uh, obviously have a greater incentive to innovate and develop cleaner technology in carbon markets, but permit buyers actually have even less incentive to uh, reduce emission compared to, say, when there's a regulation. Yeah? If regulation says you cannot emit more than this, then they'll somehow have to come up with a, a cleaner technology, but they would find it cheaper actually to buy the permits rather than trying to invest in developing uh, cleaner technology and that, that, that through that route uh, cut the emission. Yeah? There was a, a recent study that tried to identify the impact of EU's uh, ETS, uh, emission trading system, and this study found that ETS uh, increased uh, low carbon patenting by just 0.83%. Also, past experience suggests that, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. New technologies tend to get developed when there's a great urgency. But unfortunately, carbon markets don't force the firms to innovate. Instead, these markets enable some of the dirtiest polluters to postpone innovation. Your choice of technology today constrains uh, your choice of technology in the future. These are not independent. Mm? And we can become locked in into relatively dirty technology. Mm? Yeah, so a lot of experts agree that we basically need to get rid of petrol engines and move to electric cars. And the electricity generated to feed the cars 
should be based on low carbon or hopefully no carbon technologies. I mean, this is kind of scientific consensus. Yes, I mean, that the cars are becoming increasingly fuel efficient. You know, the exhaust system is that they improve all the time. But still, if you keep using this uh, the, the internal combustion engine, you will be obliged to you know, maintain the infrastructure of petrol station, you know, petrol dumps. You know. Well, in the end, it's actually not that surprising that carbon markets do not provide adequate incentives for firms to invest in new greener technologies because they are only designed to address the negative externalities. Yeah? But then, as you all know, that there are other types of externalities called positive externalities, which are usually generated by activities uh, like uh, research and development. Yeah? When you do research and development, when you train workers, yeah, you generate new knowledge. Yeah? Some of it is subject to private appropriation through patenting, but it also generates a lot of knowledge that cannot really be patented. Other people can imitate you. They can poach the workers, but they don't compensate you for this benefits that they are getting. And therefore, you do not take those benefits into account and will do those positive externality generating activities at a level that is uh, lower than the socially optimal level. Yeah? Now, carbon markets are not even designed to address these uh, externalities. Yeah? Because all it does is that, uh, to control negative externalities. Yeah? When you say these things, some more free market oriented economists argue that, yes, uh, that uh, carbon markets are imperfect, but what is the alternative? Yeah? The alternative will be somehow government deciding what's going to happen and putting regulations in. And we know that the government is at, uh, very bad at picking winners, uh, so to speak, partly because uh, they are subject to lobbying pressures uh, from sectional interest. This is at, uh, known as the government failure argument, which we discuss in our lecture on the role of the state in greater detail. And indeed, uh, the, much of these uh, investments in green technologies are made by the governments themselves uh, these days. You know, the recent reduction in the cost of alternative energy technologies, most of them actually have owed their existence to government intervention. So, for example, solar electricity costs have uh, fallen by around 90% in the last decade. But did it happen through free market? Did it happen through even carbon markets? No. So in Germany, the government gave uh, subsidies to consumers, uh, for example, to adopt uh, solar technology. And yeah, that expanded the market, which made investment in the technological development uh, profitable. And then yeah, the, the companies uh, started doing research uh, to come up with uh, better solar technology. The Chinese government gave a lot of subsidies to the producers of solar panel to reduce uh, the cost. Yeah? And they say that now solar electricity technology in China rivals that of the most advanced nations. Yeah? Well, solar e electricity is not unique. You know, for example, wind electricity in Denmark, tidal power electricity in Spain, they all were developed with government support. For another example, the LED lighting, its uh, cost has fallen, similarly to solar electricity, by about 90% in the last decade. Behind it was strong government actions. So, for example, EU and other uh, countries have banned the uh, incandescent uh, bulbs. Yeah? So, you couldn't make and sell them anymore. So, a lot of people had uh, switched over to LED lighting. Basically, for these technologies to develop, 
government support is uh, needed until a mass market begins to emerge, at which point private firms can exploit the scale economies and begin producing at low cost. Let us discuss how carbon markets are compared to taxes, the other market-based mechanism. The key advantage of permits is the certainty that they provide in meeting a pollution target. So the target is set and permits are allocated according to that target. So that will be guaranteed. So that's the strength of the carbon market. Of course, I mean, all these uh, that, uh, assumptions that there'll be sufficient monitoring, enforcement, you know, perfect information is not uh, need to hold, but at least in theory, that is the strength of the carbon market. In contrast, if you try to hit a pollution target by means of taxation, it's difficult to predict uh, what kind of tax you have to implement because uh, you do not really know how demand will respond to tax-induced changes in prices. You know? So if uh, hitting the target is important, yes, carbon markets are better than taxes. Eh? However, a big weakness of carbon markets is that they are even less likely to stimulate long-term investment in greener technologies than taxes are. Eh? Because in carbon markets, uh, the certainty of a total emission is effectively achieved by transferring all the uncertainty into the price. Yeah? This is why carbon prices uh, that, uh, go up and down that, uh, quite that, uh, dramatically. Yeah? So the EU emission trading system has experienced a very high price volatility, which then discourages investment because investment uh, sorry, investors do not like uncertainty. Eh? The carbon prices are very closely related uh, to the return on low carbon investment eh? because that, uh, basically it, uh, it will determine how much money you can earn with this investment. But if the price keeps uh, that, uh, going up and down, the investors will say, well, actually, I don't know whether I'll uh, recoup uh, my investment, whether I'll uh, earn profit. So it actually discourages investment in low carbon technologies. To add to that, you know, the permits are issued for free, whereas uh, the taxes bring in government revenue. So that, uh, there's uh, that benefit on the tax side in terms of uh, government revenue. But in the long run, the most uh, negative thing about the uh, carbon markets is that it legitimizes pollution by conceptualizing emission permits as the right to pollute. Yeah? The psychologists have shown that replacing a legal prohibition on some activity with a monetary cause actually tends to crowd out moral motivations to refrain from the activity. Even if you call that a fine, yeah? somehow it becomes okay to do it because you are paying the price. Yeah? Despite all these uh, limitations of carbon markets, which many of which are accepted even by their supporters, in reality, carbon permits are usually chosen over taxes because the large companies, which have a lot of lobbying influence, prefer carbon markets because carbon taxes mean that they have to raise prices which may not always uh, result in that uh, increased uh, revenue because uh, consumers might react uh, the, in a the negative way, or they'll have to accept lower profit. Yeah? You know, we believe that uh, the ultimate problem with these uh, market-based mechanisms, uh, carbon taxes, uh, carbon markets, is that they are not strong enough. Actually, that uh, some of the so-called Green New Dealers in the United States uh, made this uh, the interesting point, which was uh, reported recently in The Economist magazine. These people said that trying to fight climate change with uh, things like taxes and permits is akin to, and I'm quoting them, trying to defeat Hitler with a fascism tax. Yeah? 
it's not, uh, not strong enough. Yeah? You know, that this uh, the challenge of uh, climate change is literally an existential threat. It's not a normal economic problem. Yeah? You need something much more stronger than these uh, market-based solutions offered by mainstream environmental economists. These uh, the solutions simply that, that misunderstand the enormity, the urgency, and the irreversibility of this uh, climate change.